It is June the 22nd, 2021, and you're watching Curiously Polar. And we are back with another episode of our show about... Well, today I think we'll stay in the Arctic. And uh, here's Henry. No, this way, Henry and Mario. I always look in the wrong direction. This is... <laughs> Fun on the video, not interesting for anyone who listens to the audio podcast. So, yes, we are back with another part in our Explorer series. Um, today we want to talk about the heroine of Wrangell Island. I have never heard of Wrangell Island before, and you two know everything about it. So um, You have never heard about Wrangel Island before? No, and I feel really Holy stupid. Holy crap, now. really. We have to do a, a separate episode just about Wrangel Island. <laughs> That's fine. We should. That's fine. Definitely. I'm happy to learn. I'm uh, so happy like to learn. Like you say about walruses and polar bears there. It, <laughs> exactly. It's amazing how many things I learn uh, during making this <laughs> show. That's the only reason I do it. You, I don't care about. <laughs> it's it's the things I learned. Um, let's see. We have a Poland newsreel, of course. And uh, let me check. Do we have a Poland newsreel? We do. We do. Um, mm, let's yeah. let's start off with dinosaurs. Henry. Oh yes, it was dinosaurs. <laughs> You put keyword. The, well, there we, you, go. you put this in where this is your cue. Speak <laughs> a to few us. episodes back, uh, episode one hundred and twenty-five, we talked about dinosaurs in Antarctica. And last week, I just stumbled across a movie trailer, um, which is about a film called Dinosaurs of Antarctica. And I was really um, baffled, so I just uh, put the the link of that trailer into the um newsreel here it's supposed to screen at some point soon it's beautiful it's um yeah a, a lot of animation a lot of cgi of how an Antarctica might have looked uh, when dinosaurs roamed mm -hmm. the area and it's it's really terrific to see all those different um or even more dinosaurs than we talked about in the episode in that um, trailer. It's really something I'm looking forward to. It's not a feature film though. I think it's a 45 minutes um, part of film, but I'm really looking forward uh, for it. So if you have some time and you're interested, just um, Google Dinosaurs of Antarctica. Um, pretty awesome project. Yeah, link is of course in the show notes. And uh, the second item on the newsreel is hold on, I have to open the right page here. <laughs> this one. There is uh, a, an important signing coming up isn't there see it's it's not not even a signing or is it's, it a re-signing um, is it no currently is the uh, 43rd um antarctic treaty consultative meeting so um in fact the parties um who signed the antarctic treaty are meeting regularly and uh, due to covid that has been postponed um it was thought that it might be possible this year in june to have a physical meeting in in paris that then was um, just cancelled and turned into a digital meeting. So right now, until the 24th, so day after tomorrow, um, the meeting is taking place online and it marks the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty and at the same time, the 30th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol, which is also known as the Protocol on Environmental Protection. And there we have um, some some interactive content in the um, in the show notes linked, which we see in the video on the on the screen all right. Yeah, and especially uh, we have uh, the uh, the convention that is uh, uh, making all the uh, studies on the uh, on the uh, life around Antarctica, which has this uh, strange uh, CCLMR uh, logo or uh, abbreviation, Camelar. and it's usually pro pro produced. Yeah, it's pronounced Camelar. And uh, it was it was really weird the first time I thought about camels, but uh, anyway, <laughs> it's down in Antarctica. But it's uh, it's a really important treaty and uh, an example of collaboration, multinational collaborations for for uh, science. That's in, and under really the important. umbrella of the Madrid Protocol, there there is um, a kind of initiative in the past years to extend the already existing marine protected areas, um, which are in Antarctica only in the Ross Sea, uh, to extend that also to the Weddell Sea and uh, even further uh, along the Southern Ocean. Um, that has been rejected, I think, last year. And um, we see that Kamala still is campaigning for it and is uh, really trying to push it. And I'm really looking forward to see the outcomes on, on, on this 
um, meeting. And I'm, I'm just really curious how far we can get in those marine protected areas. Yeah, right. I would say even more. I'm, I'm Sp even pushing for it. <laughs> speaking, speaking of uh, interesting acronyms that I have no idea what they mean. Here's the what is the <laughs> CSR? I the CSIRO. CSIRO about. It's a, uh, a science um, umbrella in um, in Australia, and it yes. bundles like the uh, polar um, science. And uh, yeah, Antarctica, uh, Australia has actually um, cancelled some joint projects with China because it's a little bit difficult. The Antarctic Treaty says that Antarctica is only to be used um, peacefully for science and uh, not for military purposes. And this term of demilitarization or non-military purposes is creating kind of a gray zone in Antarctica where the support of military personnel is allowed, but not for military purposes. So where do the military purposes start and um, where do they end? And China is building up, um, according to the Australian sources, is building up a network of uh, research stations in Antarctica, um, which are built up by the military. This is, in the first place, nothing bad, because that's also how the US started their, um, their Antarctic um, research stations. In, in fact, the ships uh, supplying it are still um, Navy ships. But at the same time, the research institution is highly dominated by the military in China itself. And that's the, the point of critique here from uh, Australia, that China is kind of undermining the um, regulations of the Antarctic Treaty system, which still is a gray area. So it's very difficult to, to find a common ground here. And that's where um, uh, yeah, Dr. L Elizabeth Buchanan posted that on, on, on Twitter to say it, it's very difficult to uh, quarantine um, a global uh, climate from Antarctica, and as difficult as that is, it is difficult to quarantine um, Antarctica from geopolitics. So this is really something um, we have to put an eye on in terms of um, of politics to see how the Antarctic Treaty System will change in the next couple of years, um, particularly in that issue. And I just wanted to um, use the chance and um, yeah, just place that here. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, that uh, you also have uh, other nations, and not just China, that is using military uh, actually for, uh, for the basis and for research. I mean, Chile, for example, they, uh, they have the military manning and, and keeping the stations going. And it, exactly. So China is definitely not the only nation doing this. So there has to be a change in the whole treaty for, uh, for this to be, uh, to be ousted in one way or to be banned from, from, the, from the continent. All right. Indeed. And in our long-standing series on vessels in the Antarctic, here is... Uh, uh, Apparently, a bit, it's a, also a long-standing series of nuclear vessels. Of nuclear vessels. This is a bit in, of in a, the Arctic. In the Arctic. This is a bit of a scary one, right? Or is it? It is. It's supposedly uh, the most dangerous nuclear vessel um, in the Arctic, but that um, apparently does not possess a nuclear threat anymore since the... Uh, nuclear waste that was stored on that vessel um, has been uh, disposed, uh, Wait, taken so, off and uh, disposed. So there was a nuclear waste carrying vessel in the Arctic and th that was not like known to everyone? Uh, it, it was kind of common sense, or it was it was known. It was public domain. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so the the, the Lapse um, is a, a ship that was used as a carrier earlier in its career, and then just got um, defunct. And in fact, it was used as a, as a waste storage for used nuclear um, uh, material. Yeah. yeah. And from uh, other vessels, that, I guess. From right. other other vessels, exactly like icebreakers, and uh, when when that material needs to be disposed, they stored it on the lapse, and by that, uh, caused a big threat because that ship um, is in a in a very bad shape in the first place. Um, but it's also not a permanent storage for um, nuclear waste, and that got, um, yeah, handled. Yes, and uh, I mean the uh, the nuclear fuel for uh, for. Power generating um, 
both on land and on uh, and on and on vessels only last a couple of decades or maybe up to 40 decades so it's not uh, it's not forever that you can use the fuel and you have to go put it somewhere and the problem is in this case that uh, it's very close to uh, a living a living quarters of a lot of people by Murmansk and it's very close to Norway I mean Murmansk is uh, it's much closer than Oslo from here <laughs> so mm-hmm. in Tromsø so it's uh, it's good that this is removed, but uh, I must say that uh, also point out that there are quite uh, a few nuclear submarines. The most famous of is probably is the Kusk, that is uh, down uh, on the bottom of the Barents Sea and uh, is uh, full of nuclear fuel. And uh, it's not very nice to think about that. And it's going to be years before anything is done about it. All right, and in, the in in many in many terms, we we talked about that. Uh, we briefly talked about it in the last episode where. Um, we talked about um, delusion in, in the ocean. It, it's not only affecting humans, it's, a, yeah. it's affecting the entire marine yeah. ecosystem. So. The famous, uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. Yeah, yes. it's not a exactly. good thing. No. And the in, solution is not dilution. And in a similar vein, um, <clears throat> we, we now know that a lot of the toxins in the world um, start to accumulate down the food chain and up in the Arctic. And uh, yeah. that is now quite visible with some of the long-lasting chemicals that seem to be accumulating up there and yeah. are being detected in people right and yeah because uh, what to stay what happens in the arctic doesn't stay in the arctic and what happens further south doesn't say so further south and uh, the same we can say also on the on the antarctic areas and um, there is a uh, uh, two phenomena that we talk about in biology one is bioaccumulation and uh, the other one is biomagnification and uh, bioaccumulation is that if you eat uh, something with something polluting in very small doses that are sublethal or maybe even almost undetectable the body can retain them and then they accumulate so you have bioaccumulation and uh, biomagnification is when you go through the food chain so there might be very little uh, pollutant in each copper pod that a whale eats but uh, with a a lot of copper pods, you get a lot of accumulation of uh, pollutant inside a blue whale. In this case, we're talking about humans that might uh, have uh, very small doses taken in with their food, especially in the Arctic, where the local and traditional food includes a lot of uh, marine origin uh, organisms and um, and then food uh, food items, and these uh, especially the uh, fat soluble the liposoluble molecules like pfas the persistent uh, flor uh, the polyflory fluorobrominated uh, compounds they um, they accumulate in the fat of our bodies and uh, then of course when milk is given to from a mother to a child there is quite a lot of fat in that one too and uh, these uh, pollutants they go over to the child and uh, they may disrupt their hormonal system or the hormonal system of uh, of the uh, of the children and and like it's quite a serious business here and these pollutants they come from sources outside of the arctic and they are transported by atmospheric transport mostly so they are volatile they are gases and they are taken up to the arctic and uh, they are deposited in the environment and they are accumulated in the body of the animals and then they are transferred to the to the uh, to the humans so it's not just not a food chain it's a toxin chain pretty much yeah and this is why we have conventions like the uh the uh, stockholm convention or the minamata convention for for uh, for mercury the minamata conventions um f- that actually regulate the production and the um and the uh they try to ban the use of certain very dangerous toxic compounds the problem is of course that the toxic compounds that have been produced in the past decades they are still in circulation and even if you stop something there is still transport and accumulation in the arctic and the antarctic hmm. Hmm. okay hmm. on this happy note let's let's leave it <laughs> let's leave it at that that was the polo newsreel let's get to the episode so uh who is the heroine of wrangle island yeah, I, I love this um, series because we try to tackle a little bit the, the, the lesser known um, 
Polar Explorer, uh, Explorer is, right? Everybody knows the big names like Amundsen, Scott Franklin, Nansen and Wagner, but we rarely find uh, names of women uh, among them. And in the last episode, we talked about one uh, already, and this episode um, yeah, keeps on that tradition. Um, but especially in, in connection with the Icelandic Canadian adventurer, uh, William Stefansson, and the expedition he initiated and financed uh, to Wrangell Island, um, one name inevitably comes um, to mind because the only survivor of that tragic expedition was, um, in fact, the uh, Inupia seamstress um, of that expedition, Ada Blackjack. And that's what today's episode is supposed to be about. Sadly, but not too surprisingly, most people have no idea who Ada Blackjack is, not even um, many self-proclaimed polar uh, enthusiasts. So how would you guys, have you known about Ada before? No. No. Well, Mario oh, su certainly has because he knows everything. <laughs> but no, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I actually, I must say, no, I have, I had heard the name, but uh, actually, when uh, when Henry suggested this, I, uh, I went deeper because uh, I was caught into like a big hole. Like, what happened? Yeah, I know it was Wrangell Island. It was like the blackjack, and she was like a seamstress, but. She actually even even more than a scene stress. She did a lot of things, and I didn't know anything about what happened before the expedition, what happened after the expedition, and that was uh, very stimulating to to read about and to do a little right. bit of, of research so, about. I have to admit, no idea. That is. So so tell me tell me all about her. So very briefly, in in uh, late June 1923. This 25-year-old uh, woman with no wilderness survival experience um, prior to that found herself stranded and starving on that island in the Arctic and, and Siberia, to be fair, uh, only with a cat for company. And two years earlier, she was just another Nupiat uh, living in Nome, uh, Alaska. She was uh, struggling to care, care for her infant son, the only surviving child of three uh, she'd had with her husband, who'd recently abandoned her to um, the situation. So... I would love to say, um, just let's start with the with the whole topic and have a look at her entire life because what actually is really interesting is the setting the whole thing um, is happening and her environment she was born in and raised in. So Ada Delutuk is uh, born in 1898 in a tiny little place called um, Spruce Creek. That's eight miles east of Solomon, and we have um, something prepared for Solomon there already. Um, that's in Alaska, and it's Solomon itself, 30 miles east of Nome. So Nome today might be known to some polar enthusiasts as the your place where the Northwest Passage either ends or starts, as it did traditionally for um, for the explorers as well. Um, and if we look at the day she's born, 1898, that sounds like a very, very long time ago, but it isn't, uh, in fact. And if we look at it from two sides, we probably see even better how close it is. Um, first of all, it's at the edge of the 20th century. So it's only two years from 1900, and it's a very few years uh, prior to World War One. And in fact, Ada has lived until 1983, which, second of all, doesn't sound too far anymore, doesn't it? It's much, much closer, suddenly. And in 1898, that's also the year where the gold rush happened in Alaska. And uh, we have some uh, very rare pictures here from that time when thousands of people actually followed the call of that shiny metal all the way to, to Solomon. Um, so Solomon, a tiny little place which used to be a camp, a hunting camp for the Fish River tribe of the Inupiat um, Eskimo. And suddenly got flooded with people. An estimated 15,000 people lived in Solomon in the search for the new destiny. Um, and during this time, up to seven enormous dredges were scoring the Solomon River. And we also have a picture of that dredges. Look at the size of that. They were just going through the river trying to dig up some gold, uh, gold nuggets there. By 1904, this... Gold Rush boom was the supply, uh, the, 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 the city was a supply center of the Solomon River miners. So along the river, a lot of mines suddenly opened up. And it was the third largest town on the Seward Peninsula 
and it had like seven saloons, a post office, a ferry dock, um, a daily boat to Nome, horse stables, school, and even a narrow gorge uh, railroad. But in 1913, tidal storms with uh, 60 mile per hour winds and some 30 foot, uh, 40 foot um, breakers, they washed away the railroad tracks and most of the town and the once thriving village of um, thousands of people became a quiet Eskimo communi- community of 300 again. But then in 1918, the flu epidemic swept through the area, extinguishing almost the entire population of uh, Spruce Creek. So that's the historical setup we're talking about the time Ada got born into. And back in the days, the situation of the Native Americans has been devastating. Uh, no one really cared about them, right? Um, when she was eight, her father got poisoned by food. So she tried together with uh, one of her younger sisters to carry him on a sledge the whole way to um, to Nome from Spruce Creek. We remember it's 38, nearly 40 miles all the way um, by foot to make her dad see a doctor. But somewhere along the way, um, and that's very difficult to um, fathom where it was, they figured out that the father has died along the way. So they carried him back, back home, because they thought it's it's no value of um, bringing him to Nome, but rather bringing him back home. Uh, the mom was away at the time, so with the age of eight, Ada was the oldest and suddenly in charge um, of the family. So when the mother came back, she sent Ada to Nome, where she was taken in by Methodist uh, missionaries. And uh, in the mission school, she learned mathematics, composition, um, English, actually, as a language, um, handwriting. She learned how to cook the food of white people and how to wash, how to iron, how to clean and how to sew. And particularly later was very vital for a young Eskimo girl because it was a very crucial skill to survive in those harsh environments um, and conditions of the cold frozen north. So she developed a very strong faith during that time. And the faith offered her relief from the dinginess and depression of the um, Solomon region. Um, she'd never felt really um, well in the area. It was not much to do for her, but in Nome, actually, she suddenly found something for her. When Ada was 16... She married a notorious hunter and a musher named Jake, uh, Jack Blackjack. But early in her marriage, she knew that this guy was no good. She had three children by him, two of whom uh, died very um, soon after the birth. Um, he treated her very, very brutally, beating her and starving her, eventually even uh, deserting her on a Seward Peninsula. Um, so in 1921, by the time she was 22, she already was divorced. Um she was left completely poor, broke, almost naked for, for the lack of clothes and literally with no money uh, at that time. But at the same time, the five-year-old son that survived, actually, Bennett, um, was uh, tubercular and very fragile. And because she could not afford to keep him any longer on her um, very, very meager and very sporadic earnings uh, from just sewing clothes and cleaning houses, um, and because she uh, he needs just full-time attention um, of doctors and nurses. She just brought him to an orphanage where people actually could care for him and try to to make him well. And that's a very, very um, tough thing to imagine. Just just try to put yourself in the shoes. You just went through all that hardship. You have lost two of your three children and the third one being striking with tuberculosis back in the days. And now you figure you won't be able to care for your sick child. So you really have to give it into someone else's care. That really is, is heartbreaking, um, f- even for, for today's um, m- measures. Um, that's probably the most traumatic event for a young mother you can, can imagine. And just picture uh, Nome in 1921. That was one of the pictures we, we've seen earlier, um, where you had like the, the classical saloon um, alley, exactly this picture here. It was a very violent uh, town, very turbulent, very grim. There were no sewers, no ditches, no safe drinking water. Crime was really rampant. And um, inhabitants were fearing of, of their lives uh, as people were very, very frequently just shot to death or, or stopped in the middle of the town. The miners have just built the city around themselves and their own greed in 1899, just a year after Ada was born in Spurs Creek. So before that, Nome was just very, very tiny. So the gold rush actually exploded the town and just really 
um, led to a vast, vast expansion. Since then, the population of Nome had ebbed and flowed and according to uh, the climate of gold, in 1900 there had been an influx of roughly 13,000 inhabitants arriving from steamships um, and that just, it, it really went up and down. Nome was completely barren. The area there has no trees. Um, it, it ran smack against the water. The beaches were covered with prospectors and their tents. So they actually really just dug through everything to find some some, uh, some gold. In that environment, the young woman, she really did everything she could to get her son back to be reunited and living together. Um, that was for her the, the biggest thing to, to really um, yeah, work her own money to get her, her son back. It was during this time that Ada actually heard word of an expedition heading for Wrangell Island. And they were seeking uh, an Alaska native seamstress who spoke English. And that was a perfect fit for her. So let's have a quick look at the geographical setting. Um, so we have the Chukchi Sea between Alaska on the right and Russia on the left. And on the, east, on the western part of the Chukchi Sea, we have this bigger island um, off the Siberian coast. And that's Wrangell Island, which is supposed to be in back in the days um much more than an island um just to set the scene right Wrangell island was not for long known to be an island when it was discovered in uh, 1867 so only 30 years roughly before Ada was born it was thought to be a larger landmass reaching all the way to the north pole that's quite an interesting thing and I, I really think we should do an, a separate episode on, on Wrangell island because it's really a fascinating place when it was discovered, there was no Aboriginal population to be found, um, but later it should be proven that uh, paleo Eskimos have used the place uh, for hunting camps. And later on, the Soviet Union actually also uh, settled um, uh, Inuit there to just yeah claim the, the, uh, the island. In 1881, the Corvin expedition under the command of uh, Captain Hoover landed um, on Wrangell Island, and they brought with them um, a very famous naturalist uh, these days, John Moore, uh, and he published the very first um, comprehensive description of Wrangell Island. So the expedition Ada heard of in Nome was organized by the very charismatic Arctic explorer, uh, explorer Wilhelm Stefansson. And Stefansson himself, he would easily fill an episode on its own. He has a very, very um, interesting background. He was born as William Stephenson in 1879 in Manitoba in Canada. He had changed his name to William Stephenson in, in college because he thought it sounds more uh, in keeping with his like Icelandic heritage and because it seemed a more fitting name for the future explorer he always wanted to be. He believed in a concept he called the friendly Arctic. Very, very interesting and probably also uh, worth an episode on its own and portrayed the, the North as an hospitable, habitable place for, for anyone with good sense. And he had such a great convincing power in his words because he believed himself in them so completely and resolutely. Just to give you an idea how convinced he was, um, just a short quote where he was saying, given a healthy body and a cheerful disposition, a family can now live at the North Pole as comfortably as it can in Hawaii. It, it, I, I hear you chocolate. It's, it's hilarious, isn't it? I don't think it's that comfortable yes, but it's, uh, up there. I, <laughs> I don't think so either. And we have but another we have. one, even further. I think that anyone with good eyesight and a rifle can live anywhere in the polar regions indefinitely. That is a so very, it, it's not much you need. That's the, that's the epitome of, um, of optimism, I think. Exactly. So a few years yeah. back in 1913, this guy organized and led the Canadian Arctic expedition, which ended with a loss of their flagship, the Kurluk, and the subsequent deaths of nearly half of the expedition team of 25. And we have a picture from that time uh, where we see the, the, uh, the Kurluk and the men actually leaving it um, on the ice. Shortly after the Kurluk was trapped, Stefansson decided to leave the ship with a small party stating that they intended to hunt for caribou. However, the ice locked ship got carried away from the uh, area around Herschel Island, and we remember the map from the, from the area. Herschel Island is north of Alaska, and the ship got carried away all the way to Rungle Island. 
So completely different area. So when the ship sank about 50 miles north of the island, the maroon crew decided to march for Wrangell Island, where they actually stayed for a while. However, today, historians are largely divided into two fractions on the decision of Stefansson of leaving the expedition when the ship got stuck. So a lot of um, historians are convinced that he left or he abandoned ship and um, another fraction of um, historians say that he actually wanted to hunt uh, wanted to hunt caribou and wanted to um, provide for his team and during that time the ship um, actually traveled fairly fast with the ice and we're talking about some uh, 40 miles per day um, so that is a big range to to cover so it's it's really a controversial thing here so this man, he organizes another expedition to this very same island to actually claim the island and colonize it. So the idea of colonizing Wrangel Island was what really pushed that expedition. The expedition but, he didn't was, want to, but he didn't want to go himself. Exactly. That's the, 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 the very interesting <laughs> part of that. He didn't want it because he had very lucrative... Um, speaking arrangements he had a, a speaking tour a lecture tour throughout the u.s at that time which maybe was very it was also lucrative. maybe it was also bound by contract to do that uh, for the financing of the previous expedition a little bit like explorers like amundsen exactly to do yeah but the expedition he prepared and um yeah supposed others to to fulfill for him was this described by an author and i quote here at best an ill-conceived venture at worst it was a willfully negligent act of astonishing hubris. Yeah, and and, and I think I think that at that time uh, Stephenson is ignoring that in 1916 uh, uh, Varelia uh, Ostrova Vrangelia was annexed by the Soviet Union. So I mean, it is uh, it was already Russian. So we have and that's we have now moved from question marks. we have now moved from. Uh, uh, Ada. <laughs> from senseless optimism to hubris, okay? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's it's not really clear historically if he ignored that fact that um, Wrangel Island got actually claimed by Russia and is what that claim was actually accepted, largely accepted. One of the reasons why Canada and Great Britain actually refused to support that um, expedition not so much because the first uh, the previous expedition um, just ended very tragically. However, using the pull of his celebrity at the time as a, kind of a seasoned explorer, he assembled a team of four rather starstruck young men. So they were really kind of fans of him. Mm, yeah, almost groupies, if you like. And he was convinced that younger men... Um, are more readily to adopt themselves to the northern conditions. So for them, uh, for him, that was kind of the of the thing. So he assembled that very very young team, and you need to understand that Stevens and himself never really intended to join that party. Just really try to 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 tag that in. He he comes up with the idea to um, colonize Wrangel Island to prove whatever, but already had a mind of not going himself. So just to also prove. The friendly Arctic concept, he actually not only sent out this inexperienced team, but he also sent it out with only six months of supplies. So you are getting pardon? And a cat. And a cat, exactly. <laughs> There's a cat on the picture, yes. <laughs> and we are getting it makes here into very is that cat <laughs> part of the supplies or <laughs> Very good question. I, I couldn't I find anything on that. I okay. haven't actually yeah. looked. Emergency, it. emergency supply. <laughs> you never know. Like the like the dogs on other expeditions. Yeah. Yes. So Ada responded to that help wanted, and when she did so, it was not so really much for her traditional Inupiat survival skills because she actually didn't had any. Um, mm. Rather, she um, she has been taught English by the Methodist missionary, so that was her big plus. She spoke English um, as a native, but at the same time, also um, know, uh, knew how to, to, to sew, how to cook, and how to keep house in, in a Western style. And that's where the actual skills um, which Ada was hired for. The outlook for Ada was quite promising, even though she had um, some doubt. But she actually was promised $50 per month. And that was an amount for her 
unheard of before that. Far more she ever could make tailoring cloth around Nome. And that's also something um, that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about um, Ada. It's not so much that she's an explorer. She never wanted to be one. She never was one. She never considered herself to be one. But she eventually became some. So the concerns she had were nothing next to gaining the money that would eventually allow her to reunite with her son. So on, on September 29, Ader set uh, sail on a ship called Silver Wave with those four very enthusiastic but completely underprepared men and <laughs> doubtlessly the unimpressed cat, uh, which actually had the name Victoria. So let's have a quick look at the well, expedition party. The, name, the party. name of the cat is delivered? Wow. Oh, yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's Vic, Victoria. It's amazing. So the expedition and it, and it survived. It survived longer so than I would, the man. I would, I would think <laughs> it did, it's indeed. probably it was probably not part of the supply because you wouldn't name your supply, would you? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Interesting question. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on. So the expedition party of of five actually consisted of those four men, and in charge was the second youngest of all, Alan Crawford, twenty. Um, he. Why he was in charge, no one really knows. The only person who had previous um, expedition experience was Lorne Knight. He was 28, and he was... Um, and that's not true. It wasn't Lorne Knight. It was Fred Mora, also 28. But he was on the previous um, expedition with um, Stefanson already um, when the the Corlux sank, and he got stranded on Wrangell Island. He never really... Um, integrated back into his regular life down in Texas where he came from uh, again. So he was really seeking new adventures. He joined Staffanson on his lecture tours uh, for a while. And during that time, uh, Staffanson convinced him uh, on that uh, venture. And so together with a 19-year-old Milton Gale and the 23-year-old uh, seamstress uh, Ada, those five actually um, just set off. So that's the the scheme of fitting Stephenson's idea, uh, Stephenson's idea of um, faster adoption of young men to the northern conditions. So you can see he's really kind of a pattern. It's, it's not so much having experienced explorers like um, Amundsen, for example, or Nansen, who were really um, very thoroughly selecting their expedition team uh, according to ex expertise and experience. Here it's rather having uh, young folks more important than anything else. So the um, misplaced admiration of those four young men really have uh, brought them into a very, very dangerous uh, situation, even though they were kind of convinced of the Arctic being a friendly place to live um, for men <laughs> who use common sense. So they left Nome in September 1921, uh, and let's have a look at their destination at Wrangell Island. We have a beautiful... Uh, map from National Geographic here, uh, illustration more. Oops. And yes. you can see that Rongel Island is quite mountainous um, with a flat spit on the southwest, which is here on the on the left side, and a particularly flatter northeastern part. And because most of, of the year the island is enclosed by, by uh, heavy sea ice, it is uh, the perfect polar bear territory. And it has a high concentration of polar bear dens, um, as you can see with those polar bear icons um, highlighted on the map, one of the reasons why it's uh, a nature preserve uh, in these days and why it still is kind of a popular destination for expedition cruisers to go there, have a high density of polar bears, a high density of walrus. It's a really um, yeah marvelous place to go. However, back in the days, the summer season was really, really short. Um, summer season necessary with no sea ice to be able to land with a the ship there. So, they arrived during the summer season and the first months of the expedition went really smoothly. Um, the, while the men hunted and, and cared for the slat dogs and set up meteorological instruments, Ada did what she was hired for. She repaired their jackets, their hoods and, and, and other clothes. Game was um, by no means as abundant on the island as Stephenson has told them it would be. So that was the first setback here. They figured the stories um, he told them by never visiting Wrangell Island himself, by the way, um, was a completely different setup what they actually found. But the crew, however, managed to hunt enough to stay um, comfortably fat for quite some, some time. 
That, uh, then with the dying light of summer, the game vanished and the pack ice closed uh, with no sign of a ship. And unknown to the party, the ship Teddy Bear, also a very interesting name for a ship, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, that was chartered to pick them up, um, that had been forced to turn, uh, turn around because of mm. uh, the ice just closing in and just uh, getting thicker and thicker. So as the weather turned, the expedition face the reality that their inadequate stores would have to last another year. So they were not prepared for staying for so long. And they didn't really even know that the ship um, was trying to, to reach them and, and simply couldn't because of their sea ice conditions. The realization of that situation slowly set in and um, particularly Ada just realized that they would need to stay another year and that probably the supplies won't last that long. So the supplies barely lasted them the summer. So how are, were they supposed to um, last another winter? So in January of 23, um, they were already starving. The temperatures, they dropped to minus 48 degrees Celsius. It's roughly minus 60 uh, Fahrenheit. And... One of the expeditioners, Knight, he went sick with scurvy um, at the time. And the three relatively healthy men, they just decided to risk a track across the pack ice and uh, try to reach the Siberian coast to get some help. They actually left. They left Ada with a sick Knight and they never returned. So I never get seen again. There's no sign of where they actually disappeared. So the next half year, Ada spent... Um, caring for for night serving as his nurse doctor companion hunter woodsman she actually took over all the responsibilities the team of four prior shared uh, but true to the, the ironies of, of real life of a fiction this did nothing uh, to endear the dying men to her rather ada became the target for his helplessness and he get really um yeah, really into a rage which he projected onto her um, over his helplessness. It's really, really difficult uh, situation. He berated her. Um, he blamed her for not taking better care of him or even um, went so far as to claim that um, her husband had been right to abuse and abandon her. There was no wonder two of her children uh, had died to, uh, to her incompetence and that Ada was certainly trying to kill Knight by steadily starving him. Knight shot out those indictments um, despite the fact that Ada, also starving herself, always gave him uh, most of the game she hunted along with the choices uh, cut of meat. And uh, both diaries of, um, of Knight and uh, Ada have been uh, preserved actually. And um, given those facts, we actually see that in the moments where uh, Knight was by, with, with a clear, clear mind, he realized that. So you can really see it was the the situation, the psychological pressure on uh, him being sick and helpless and really dependent, um, yeah, counting tribute. But when Knight died in, in June 23, so the party left in January, in June Knight died, the cat Victoria became Ada's only companion on the island, um, apart from um, the occasional visiting polar bear. But it was her son and the wish of hers to reunite with Bannett that, that really kept her going. So she put all the effort in to, to survive. She was far too weak to bury Knight. So she just decided to stack boxes around uh, his body and um, just left him in his bad role. She moved into the storage camp to um, escape the <laughs> rather strong smell of decay, understandably. So she turned the storage tent into a new home. She repaired the tent. Um, she strengthened it with driftwood. She crafted even a gun rack um, for her rifle, just positioning it over her sleeping bag in the Kaiser polar bear approach. So very, very smart improvements and a quite a big development for 23, 24, 25-year-old at that time to, um, yeah, to, to take on that uh, challenge. And then... Ida endured three more months of complete human um, isolation during which she practiced uh, shooting birds and setting traps for uh, Arctic foxes. 
she was remarkably resourceful in that uh, period. So she learned how to set traps to lure white foxes. She taught herself to shoot birds, to build a platform buffer shelter so that she could actually spot polar bears in the distance. And she crafted a, a skin boat from driftwood and uh, some stretch canvas. Um, she lost a little bit of uh, face in that, so she built even um, a swimming platform and so on. She even experimented with the expedition's photography equipment, um, and she was taking uh, pictures of herself standing, standing outside of the camp. So we actually have even um, yeah, yeah, real pictures of, of her selfies. in that situation. Yes, exactly. First selfies. In short, Ada has taught herself to do all the things her or my crew did not have experience enough to do so to survive the expedition in the first place. And that's even more remarkable considering her personal lack of traditional education. So that's a very interesting turn the story here um, takes for, for Ada. But though all the evidence uh, demonstrate that Ada adapted admirably um, to her fate, her, her diary um, reveals quite some physical and mental strain, um, which was almost entirely fixated on the ignoring fear that she would never see her son again. And in August uh, 1923, almost two years after the first landing on Wrangell Island, the schooner Donaldson appeared um, over the horizon um, to rescue the uh, preserving seamstress, who was doing actually quite well on her own. Um, she strode out to meet the crew, um, wrapped in, in a reindeer jacket she had um, soon herself, and it's been reported that she welcomed the sailors with a smile on her face. Um, possibly not a smile of, I'm doing quite well, but rather of um, relief. So the men of the Donaldson were properly impressed and um, is a, yeah, is like, how to say, in uh, on seeing her, Finally, Tune Camp, they really claimed that um, she had mastered the Arctic environment like no one they knew before. And uh, she and Vic could have lived there for at least another year. Um, Ada, however, did not really test this hypothesis, um, nor did she <laughs> <laughs> welcome the praise uh, that went along with that. Um, according to her, she was just a mother who wanted to see her, her child again. So shortly after returning home with uh, Victoria, so she took in the cat, um, the tale of Ada's long ordeal did the 20th century equivalent of going viral. So Ida was surrounded by press, uh, greedy to recount her story to the masses. They uh, touted her as hero and the female uh, Robinson Crusoe. But the very quiet seamstress, they, she shielded away from the attention and, and the titles, insisting that she was simply a mother of, uh, of that really had the need to get home to her son. So... She and Ballard eventually were reunited, and though her payment from Stephenson was less than uh, he promised, she was able to afford um, a treatment um, for her son in Seattle. So he was treated there um, for uh, um, tuberculosis, but though her retain was, uh, return was initially met with kind of a near overwhelming admiration, many questioned um, her story later on, and the whole thing just turned into uh, accusations of negligence against her. Ader eventually returned to Alaska, where she had another son, Billy. Um, but rather than enjoying the easier life that uh, should have been afforded her by her newfound prestige, Ader's remaining years were not so much sunnier than uh, the time in, in outer Siberia. She was really troubled with poverty the rest of her life, and unfortunately, Bennett never grew to full health. So the profits and the praise of the Bungled Wrangell Island expedition were primarily enjoyed by the author William Stephenson, who was heralding Ada's story as the most romantic in Arctic history and very good uh, self-promoter in that, uh, that way. He wrote a book about it titled The Adventure of Wrangell Island, which is uh, hilarious if you consider the, the whole um, setup of the failed expedition. I don't think they've been there. Exactly. And Ida uh, saw none of the money that actually um, yeah, got raised through that. So the smear campaigns against her um, really, really uh, nagged on her, um, which claiming were, were claiming a lot that she was not really um, caring for night, and that's the reason why he died. There were claims about um, cannibalization um, in the room, which could be um, rejected throughout time, but 
at the time for her, who was this shy young girl, um, that was really tough time. So her son Bennett uh, died of a stroke in 1972 um, at 58 years uh, of age. And unfortunately, Ada joined him uh, roughly 10 years later on May 29 in 1983, when she was 85 at the uh, Palmer Pensioners' home close to um, An uh, Anchorage. And no one in the Pensioners' home actually knew she was once an Arctic hero. So she was um, later buried on uh, Bennett's side. Um, there is a beautiful short film out there called Ada Blackjack Rising, which I highly recommend. It's a six minutes piece. Um, the film is an experimental dramatic short. It's directed by Bryce uh, Habiger, and it brings together the current uh, inhabitants of northern Alaska with that legendary woman from the same land. The film is uh, based on the possibly most comprehensive biography on, on Ada out there, which was written by Jennifer Niven and called... Ida Blackjack, a true story of survival in the Arctic. Um, all of that would never have been possible um, without her second son, Billy, who really remembered Ada very, very fondly as a loving mother and did so much to really make sure that um, his mother was not forgotten as one of the most greatest heroines of Arctic exploration, which is exactly how we should remember her too, I think. And it's very interesting to see what kind of gems are out there which are not largely known. And Billy went on uh, and became the vice president of the uh, American Federation of Natives. So he was very active for natives' rights and uh, a precursor of the uh, like uh, local traditions and the uh, uh, highlighting of the value of the, uh, of the knowledge about the environment, the uh, uh, traditional knowledge or that uh, that we is so important in the work that is done today. It's what, really really interesting. What an amazing story, and I don't think I'm a great fan of that Stevenson guy. I mean, <laughs> well, what? I uh, think jerk. I think Sorry. Uh, well, I think that we have. It's difficult to 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 judge with uh, today's uh, today's eyes. I mean, he was uh, actually a much uh, more amiable person than uh, I might say here, even though I've. Uh, I'm hosted by by Norway, and I become a Norwegian uh, citizen last year. Oh, uh, congratulations! But, uh, but uh, yeah. it was not uh, it was not as uh, as um, it was more amiable than Roald Amundsen. Okay. Uh, um, in, uh, yeah. <laughs> like uh, also like in, in what he did after his expeditions and how he treated his uh, his uh, his fellow expedition members. So there's but, more uh, more dirty laundry to and, be had there. But uh, but then we also have to understand that uh, Stefansson is in the same. He was born actually the same year as Knut Rasmussen, the uh, the Danish Inuit uh, uh, explorer, and uh, he was uh, like all these um, quotes about uh, this uh, pan Arctic uh, people. They are in the spirit of the time. I mean the uh, great dog sleigh right, uh, travel or dog sleigh journey of uh, Knut Rasmussen is in that spirit here. So he was riding the wave of that sort of uh, of thinking. And uh, and then, of course, like uh, living off the expedition was not easy for him. Uh, and he needed to uh, probably to fulfill contracts and uh, to think about uh, how to how to how to live himself, but uh, and and the rights the what what we know as copyrights and the rights of the people that uh, are mentioned in stories and and books that's something that was developed a little bit later. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, fair so. enough. And if we, if we, but, if we uh, put him uh, into the right time frame, that was also the time when people still thought there might be a, a ice free landmass in the North Pole, um, which was still not entirely certain at the time. So yeah. he he really was part of the zeitgeist, if, if you like. And yeah. um, his previous expeditions were very, very... He was very famous for achieving a lot in the Canadian Arctic before he turned into that ill-fated Korolek mm. expedition. And um, you yeah, were facing the, um, the accusation of um, abandoned uh, his expedition to yeah. um, hold his own lectures and then sending out the completely unprepared expedition uh, to, to Wrangell Island. That was a very bad finish, but he recovered very, very well from that. 
Yeah, but how how about that um, that boat that uh, rescued Ada, uh, Ada Blackjack? Because there was uh, a, a guy called Charles Wells and uh, twelve or eleven uh, Inuit or Inupiat people that were set off on, on Wrangell Island. I couldn't find any information of, of what happened of that expedition. They they stayed there. I mean, they the ship took Ada back and left twelve persons on this island. Hmm, true. Do you know anything about that? Um, I I know that the Soviet Union just a few years later um, relocated uh, Inuit on not sure if it's Inuit um, native um, from natives from the from the area from Siberia to mm. the island um, and they couldn't find any remains there so I, I would need to look into that a little further to see if they got picked up again. Yeah, I think I'll uh, I'll try it even even further uh, to go even deeper as well so that. Uh, because that's that's a very interesting thing, and and Wrangell mm-hmm. Island. I mean, now we know that Wrangell Island has been uh, also the last uh, refuge of the mammoth. So we could talk about that too it at is. one point. I'm, I, I see I see wonderful episodes coming up in the future. So oh, yes. we are, we have to go back to Wrangell Island. Actually, uh, like, have you, have you been there, that, Henry? More than happy. No, I haven't. I haven't. No, uh, neither have I. So we should end. And I'm sure that Chris would also join us for an expedition just, to Wrangell Island. Oh, so I'll, exactly. I'll be just first charter to be a there, ship. Yeah. And then uh, we just do a live episode on location. There should be. Yeah, we definitely do that. <laughs> All for it. So with <laughs> that, let's uh, wrap this up. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to uh, click the like button. Give us a bit of love there. Um, other than that, yeah, we are back soon with another episode. And uh yeah, you can find us at the usual spots on at curiouslypolar.com. We are, of course, online on the social media. And uh, uh, every now and then we even post there. So <laughs> make sure to follow <laughs> us there as well. Um, and with that, everyone, thanks for being here. Take care. Bye-bye. That was a good but one. Really nicely. That was a very, yeah. very well prepared one, Henry. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was that was really, really nice. I, I was I a little bit scared it, that it might have been too too much of um, yeah, just constant uh, wobbling from from one side. But I really loved um, how how you just pitched in there. Really great. <clears throat> um, and yeah, you can and. Really and Mario Try just to build the episodes more to to get it more active. Yeah, more um, Mario. Just just as a reminder. When Henry talks, you need to interrupt him. You need to have a very, very <laughs> sharp think, elbow yes. and just elbow your way in there. So. I think uh, I think this uh, this Ada was uh, was really good, and I think the highlighting the fact that she, even though she was a native, she didn't learn the native ways. I mean, not as a as a young woman, she probably learned and saw these things as a as a child, and and learning how to shoot. I imagine she had to reload the uh, the cartridges. I mean, it's not just that you take things off the shelf, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and not if you have never shot a seal or even even abundant. If you have never done any of these as an adult, it's amazing that she could do all of this. And she didn't have probably the prejudice about eating the liver or the blubber or these things. So that's uh, but if that's what. Looking- if you look into the biography, and I really mm. highly recommend that book. It's a yeah, really good book. Yeah, I should buy the book, yeah. The, the fact that she peeled out, uh, the, the author, is that even though she she got, uh, she grew up in, in that environment of, uh, of, of her like native community, already in Spruce Creek, she was rather kind of a city uh, Inuit than uh, like, a, like a nomadic Inuit because... They were settling there, and the environment that uh, she grew up had not much to do with the the classical hunting. That mm. actually changed after she came back from from Wrangell Island. She became a reindeer herder, and um, she was still trapping for for foxes and so on. Not a classical hunter or, um, mm. or yeah, a whale hunter or something, but uh, more. Um, let's say more traditional than she used to be uh, when she was a, a child. How, how, hmm. how she grew up. 
Yeah, Three probably like ago. the environment must have changed quite a lot after the gold rush and the world war. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, things. just, so just, just like, imagine yeah. if a, a small fishing camp for, for, for Inuit just got loaded with people, 15,000 hmm. at a time, and then they just disappear two years later. It's yeah. just hilarious. It just, uh, yeah, we should have this conversation recorded and put on the show <laughs> because this, uh, these are actually quite interesting things. I mean, the consideration of what it must have been out there and, and what we perceive where the, uh, the, the world should be right now. I mean, I'm talking about environmental protection, about the protection of the indigenous rights, the land claims, and, and all this. It's just amazing what, what a change has happened. Indeed, yeah. I am, by and, the way, and we are still this. Yeah. Ah, okay, you are. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I, I, I was, I was, I was betting on it. I might sticking it to the end, uh, at least part of it. Yeah, like uh, like extra material. I, I think I think it is it is worth considering that this was uh, was not just a, a, a feat for the for the for the person, but also that it's to be put into social context and also into the the way the way people treated. <clears throat> The Inuit. I mean, I, I also think about sending four young men in their twenties with a young woman over there. Yes. Like the it it requires some sort of discipline in there, which might not have been there. N- nicely so put. I want yeah. I wonder I wonder what happened in in those situations and yeah. and uh, and it's sad that she didn't uh, get uh, the honors while she was uh, while she was alive because she was uh, not uh, present when the, the this biography was uh, was was made and uh, yeah mm. even even and, Billy didn't um, mm. didn't uh, make wasn't it, alive no. anymore he mm. died like five years before that um, biography mm. finally got published. I think the biography um, was published in 2007 and, and Billy mm. died in 2003. Mm. 